so first of all thank you very much uh, this is going to be a very uh, comprehensive presentation i'm not trying to get into a lot of details of a lot of things but i want to give you guys a flavor of uh, how the drilling of oil and gas wells is being conducted how a uh, technology intensive process it is and uh, what the future entails for us so um this is just a quick overview of our presentation uh we will start with where the hydrocarbons is how we have this uh idea that there is a big pool of oil or gas uh below the surface which is not actually correct it's a, it's a very different phenomena as what is perceived by a lot of people um then why we drill gas oil and gas wells where the drilling fits different type of wells different type of rigs onshore offshore uh what type of drilling hardware so we will kind of dissect what are the different components of oil and gas rig and then after that you can actually once you see a rig you can actually identify some of those components uh there is a very big portion of that uh drilling um process that is that is uh uh that is taken by the drilling fluid we are going to talk about the drilling fluid uh, in in a tiny bit detail and then we are going to talk about directional drilling and how it has changed the world as we see it right now and then in the end we will try to give 15 20 minutes for a discussion so where are the hydrocarbons so unlike a very popular opinion usually hydrocarbons are there are three things if you want to understand a hydrocarbon reservoir whenever somebody is talking about the about a oil and gas reservoir they are talking about the three things they are talking about the source rock uh they are talking about the migration focus they are talking about the reservoir uh and they are talking about the structure so there are three things which i want to of want you to focus over here one of them is the seal which is right over here uh the trap um i'm just going to change my pointer to a laser pointer uh so there is a trap there is a reservoir and then there is a migration so source rock so first and foremost thing is the source rock source rock is where your organic matter is trapped that is where your oil and gas will be created because of the pressure and the temperature so once that oil and gas is created through a migration pattern or migration focus it will go into because this the source rock is a very porous rock so it it cannot hold the oil and gas for a very long time so what's what's going to happen is it will migrate and it will migrate towards a seal so it will keep on keep on migrating until it hits hits the seal rock seal rock is the one it will which will prevent it from migrating any further and you will have uh the porous rock on top of which there is a seal and the oil and gas are actually trapped under these pores and it will start making kind of a reservoir which is just a very porous rock containing oil and gas uh also the salt domes or uh kind of act like a a seal reservoir so it will prevent from uh, all all of that oil and gas organic matter from going any more further so source rock is primarily your limestones your shales uh in which the organic matter is preserved and then for conversion to oil and gas usually for oil it takes 110 to 130 degrees celsius and this can be under a depth of 2.5 to 3.5 kilometers and usually you you will find that oil and gas actually occurs within a depth of 2 to 3 kilometers the reason for that is that it requires immense pressure pressure to convert that organic matter into oil and that is actually provided by that depth of earth that is on top of your organic matter to compress it and under a certain temperature condition it will convert it into gas into oil uh, for gas you need a temperature higher than 150 degrees celsius and usually your depth increases to almost 4 kilometers common type of source rock as i mentioned earlier your limestone your mudstone and your coal these are porous rocks that will contain this organic matter and they will they will act as a source rock reservoir are commonly your common type of reservoir rock are sandstones and your uh, or your limestones they are called reservoir rocks because their porosity will decrease by compaction cementation and clay so what will happen is that they will start uh, filling up that organic matter and they will start gathering it from all the other source rocks which are in the surroundings and they will keep it uh, within themselves 
seal or a cap rock. This is usually as the name indicates, it acts like it's a very low permeability zone. It will prevent any migration focus of the oil and gas. So you, what you can see in this um, over here in this, it's a very good example. There's a cap rock at the, at the top. There is a reservoir at the bottom and there are these pore spaces. And what's gonna happen is that your oil is gonna just formulate itself or form itself between these pore spaces. Um, seal rocks, they are characterized by very small pore sizes. That means the capillary forces are more than the buoyancy forces. Uh, most of the common type of cap, cap rocks are mudstones, ev evaporites. Uh, usually in terms of uh, cap rocks, evaporites are providing the best seals. Also the salt domes also provide a very, very uh, uh, good seal rock. Um, evaporites is just another name of the salt domes. How do we explore? So this is an example from 19, 1908 where we, they were uh, with the very early explorers, they were the pioneers were actually trying to uh, find oil and gas. And they were trying to use very, very basic methods, just like how we use uh, right now, sometimes in some of the areas in developing countries, we use uh, these kind of methods for finding water. Very initially they were using uh, field mapping. So what we, they were trying to do was that they were trying to find cap rocks. And what they were trying to say is that, okay, if there is a cap rock over here, there's a possibility that there might be oil and gas in the source reservoirs, in the seal rock, in, in below this, uh, this this cap rock or between below this seal rocks. So very, very initial days. But now the things have become really, really advanced. Uh, now we use seismic uh, equipment to find oil and gas. And this is a typical kind of a seismic array. You have your echo phones or your seismic phones which are being pulled by uh, a ship, uh, a seismic ship. Uh, and what's gonna happen is that there is a source at the end of the ship and this source will emit acoustic waves. These acoustic waves will travel below the, below the surface of water. And then once they hit the cap rock, they will bounce back to the echophones. And what's gonna happen is that through this, you will try to find the cap rock and by looking at the geological features which are nearby the cap rocks, you will try to formulate or triangulate the position of a reservoir. Things have gone a really long way since the initial pioneering days. Uh, this is just an example. There are a lot of companies out there that actually have uh, really advanced seismic equipment. This is seismic equipment is not only just used on offshore, but also onshore on the land. Uh, so you we will have, as I mentioned earlier, you will have a ship that is actually towing uh, uh, two types of uh, things, the air guns. So they will provide a very high pitched pulse. Uh, these air guns are usually located to the center of the mass. And then you have uh, mono, mono wings or echo phones at the far ends. And what they are trying to do is that the air guns will provide the source uh, of the acoustic and the uh, echo guns will actually pick up uh, those acoustic signals. So in this way, uh, the focus has actually gone into a 3D seismic uh, uh, data collection because they are trying to trying to have a 3D model of that uh, reservoir at the cap rock. Uh, this is just an example of a 2D uh, seismic survey. Uh, what they, what you can see over here is that they have actually trying to figure out because cap rock will actually give you a different type of sig uh, acoustic signal than the reservoir rock and similarly source rock. So they are trying to figure out that, okay, this is your cap rock because it's lightly shaded. Uh, and then uh, your reservoir are more deeply shaded because there was more uh, cap rock because it's seal rock, less permeability. So it will actually deflect the acoustic waves better compared to reservoir rock where it will actually absorb the uh, acoustic waves. So by correlating that data, what they're trying to figure out is where the cap rock is and where your reservoir and source rocks are. And once they are already done with this, they're actually trying to have a 3D visualization of the field. Uh, they're trying to figure out that these are the, the salt domes. Uh, and then um, they are trying to figure out if they have to drill, uh, what they will do is that they will drill one single well, and then they will do laterals or multilaterals. In this case, it's multilateral. So they will actually have a kickoff point. And from that kickoff point, they will actually go 
to a deeper reservoir or shallower reservoir and more multilaterals as you go down. And this is very, very predominant when you go actually go into the offshore wells because in offshore wells, you it's very difficult. Uh, so initially when the drilling first started, they used to drill right on top of the, of the reservoir. So they will drill one well and it will go directly into the, into, the, into the reservoir. Now with the advancement of technology, what they have actually figured out is how to, how to drill one well and then actually have different kickoff points so you can have actually different, so you can actually tap your reservoir better. And this is just an example of that. You have a 3D uh, a simulation of the reservoir and then diff your different laterals. So why do we drill wells? Um, there are different type of reasons why we drill wells. Number one is collecting data. These are what we call exploratory wells. We are going to discuss these in the coming slide. Um, exploratory wells are just to collect data and see that whether this reservoir has potential to be drilled in the future. The second reason is obviously pro to produce oil and gas. This is usually done when you have a very good understanding of the subsurface structure. And then finally, to inject oil and gas, to inject water and gas. So in a lot of locations, you have a lot of produced water and there is no way to dispose it off uh, in a more responsible way. So what you do is that the produced water will be injected back into the reservoir and it actually helps you to have extended oil recovery. That means it will help you to recover more out of that reservoir by injecting water and gas. And then similarly, gas, sometimes it's not very economical to flare it off. So what we'll do is that we will drill some wells on the periphery of your reservoir and we will inject gas in it. And what's gonna happen is that this gas will actually push more of that oil in that, in that uh, uh, source rock into your, uh, into your reservoir. And then we can have a more extended recovery. So where does the drilling fit? So this is kind of a life cycle of a well, uh, what you can say. Uh, this may not be very, uh, uh, it may differ from field to field, well to well, but usually what happens is that you will first drill exploratory wells uh, just to see if this area has potential. And after that, you will drill appraisal wells. Appraisal wells are primarily, uh, you are trying to characterize how much oil and gas you can actually get from this field. And then after that, you will do uh, your production wells uh, or development wells. These development wells can be two types, production and injection. Production, as you as the name it suggests, that this is more to produce oil and gas. Injection is more to inject water and gas back into that reservoir. Uh, usually, it spans over the period of 10 to 30 years. Uh, eventually, you will see that your production rates are really high. But as you go into a more maturing field, uh, between the area of 10 to 20 years, the field becomes more mature, so your production starts to decline. And as you go towards 30 years, it comes to a point where it's not economically feasible to produce from these wells. So you will, you will go into that abandonment phase. That means you will pull out the tubing, you will cut your casing, you will plug the well, and then you will restore it to its original condition. Uh, this 10 to 30 years, it's not, it's not um, a rule of thumb. Uh, it very much depends upon your field, uh, but this is just to give you an idea that in, in the initial years, the well produces really good, so it's very economical to produce, but once it gets into the maturing phase, starts to production, starts to decline, going to a point where it's not uh, producing that much anymore. As I mentioned earlier, there are three types of wells, exploration wells. These are also called wildcat wells. These were drilled initially by our pioneers and they were trying to prove where the earth was. They were trying to uh, characterize the subsurface uh, structure. They were doing a lot of electrical logging to kind of see where the oil and gas is. Uh, and, and these were, as the name suggests, these were just for exploration. Uh, they were not meant to produce anything. Uh, appraisal wells, they are primarily whenever the free, whenever the company or oil and gas company decides to uh, invest in a certain field, certain reservoir, offshore, onshore, uh, what they will do is before making that decision, they will kept, they will have a drill ship uh, on the location um, and they will drill cup, a couple of appraisal wells just trying to see that the 3D seismic survey that was done earlier 
kind of correlates with what is present uh, actually down home. And then once the appraisal well results come, the company decides to come go forward for the investment, then they will start drilling the development will, developmental or production wells, and that they, that they will try to uh, build different facilities to tie those production wells to. As I mentioned earlier, so initially in the pioneering days, the brig used to be placed on top of the reservoir. It used to drill direct straight so that it can tap to the reservoir directly. Uh, it had to be directly over the target. Uh, and mostly these exploration wells are still drilled like this, but uh, initial uh, uh, drilling was actually done like this because we did not have the technology to actually have lateral wells. Uh, if you go out in California, uh, especially in Bakersfield area, you will see areas like this, where there are thousands, thousands of derricks uh, on the land. Um, these are directly vertical wells. They were drilled a century ago, and some of them are still producing. But then there is a concept of deviated wells, multilaterals, laterals, horizontal drilling, which we are going to discuss in, in the future, in the coming slides. And what's ha gonna happen is that your drill is, your drill rig is somewhere else and it will drill straight. And then there will be a kickoff point where the drill bit will actually take an angle and then it will go in at, at an angle and then it will actually straighten down and then it will. So you can see that it has actually not drilled in a straight line. Um, they are, uh, that means your drill can actually stay in place and actually can drill different wells uh, at different depths. It's quicker, um, it's easier, but it's harder to do. It takes a little bit of more time uh, and it is a little bit more costly. So why direct, directional drilling? And this, this picture will give you kind of a flavor of why we want to do directional drilling. You can see you in the, in the first one, which is a platform of a pad. Uh, you can see you have different, different reservoirs and you will drill one well and it will go into different uh, reservoirs. And then uh, in the salt dome, dome drilling, you can actually go straight in and then you can actually have a, a point, uh, a kickoff point, and then you will go at an angle. Then similarly, this is what we call horizontal drilling. Uh, what's gonna happen is go, gonna go straight and then it will start going uh, in a straight line. And what's going to happen is that it will tap all that reservoir that unless uh, you, you do this, you won't be able to tap the entire reservoir. And it will stay in this line and it does not have to go straight in in different locations just to tap in this reservoir. You can see that how much money, how much effort, how much emissions we have saved by this way. And then a couple of other scenarios, uh, you can actually do it for site tracking, uh, for relief wells. That means, for example, if you have a blowout on one of the locations, uh, you have an uncontrolled exposure of hydrocarbons up on the surface. Um, so you can see a fire over here. Then you need to drill a relief well. That means uh, rather than going up on this location and burning it off, um, it will start going into uh, a a different different well so that we can actually securely cap it off. Uh, then fault controlling, sometimes because of the seismic activity, because of the seismic structure, we cannot drill straight. Uh, then to avoid the, the, the faults uh, that are subsurface, we actually do what we call a fault controlling. Uh, and then inaccessible locations, for example, if you have urban uh, areas or built up areas on top of your uh, a reservoir, then you want to have a drill rig position as far as you can um, from that reservoir and then do a directional drilling to tap off that reservoir because um, number one, uh, being very close to the built up areas or the urban areas is, is, is not feasible because of the safety and health reasons. So horizontal wells, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this has actually bought a revolution in, in actually taping the shale uh, reservoirs. Uh, the shale revolution that happened in US was primarily because our ability to do horizontal wells right now. Um, as I mentioned, you have rig at one place. It will, it will move slightly if you have to tap different horizontal reservoirs, but it will, don't, it will not have to move 
by a much greater distance. This is what we call a pad drilling that it will move by 10 meters or five meters and then it will drill another well and then another 10 meters drill another well or 20 meters drill another well. And that way one rig can access many targets uh, rather than having multiple rigs on site. Um, if if somebody has actually flown flown on top of uh, Texas, uh, when you go towards Permian or Midlands, you will see a lot of these small, 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 small uh, oil and gas wells. And believe me, these are what we call uh, wells that are drilled through pad drilling. That means uh, you actually had a rig at one position, and or it moved. By, by certain distance, one rig moved by a certain distance and drilled all these wells. So you can see that although there will be a one uh, well at the top, but it act, it is actually have through horizontal drilling, it is actually penetrated much more in a, in a horizontal direction subsurface. Then how far we can drill, we can drill horizontally, we can drill kilometers and kilometers, five to six kilometers is, is is very common. That means your drilling rig can be right over here in a built up area and it will drill below the uh, river into the other side of that U bank. So five to six kilometers is, is not considered a big deal anymore. Uh, this is just an example, just for you to appreciate that uh, how how advanced the technology is that you, your rig can be positioned over here and it will drill horizontal well, which are at a much bigger distance to each other. Uh, this is just an example of uh, uh, one of the developments that BK, BP did uh, in, uh, in uh, Foggy Island. Um, your rig was actually positioned over here and then you can see that uh, this well is around 30,000 feet. Uh, this is 32,000 feet, and this is 28,000 feet from uh, your rig location. Now, types of rigs. Uh, usually, onshore, there is one simple type of rig that we are going to discuss in the coming slide. But as you go offshore, because of the complexity, because of the depth, your type of rig will change. Um, for example, if it's a shallow water up to 1500 feet, then you would want to have like a drilling barge or a, or a fixed platform. Uh, that means your platform is fixed. You will have the spart uh, or, or structural steel uh, anchored to the ground, and then you have platform at the top. Then complement tower is also for shallow kind of a drilling, uh, 1500 to 3000 feet. But as you start going deeper and deeper, you can see that you cannot have a structure anchored at the bottom. It's just not physically possible. Uh, neither you would want that. So you will have like anchored kind of structures at the bottom, um, tension leg platforms. And for very ultra deep, deep sea, subsea applications, you have spar platform um, with subsea structure. That means your BOP, your sub subsea compression, everything will be down. Uh, on the seabed and your, your uh, including your BOP, but rest of the structures, like even for tension leg platforms, uh, floating production systems, everything, the BOP is at the surface and then you will have uh, uh, your subsea landing string and everything, which is connecting uh, uh, to your uh, uh, subsea structure. So as you go deeper and deeper, and now we can actually drill really deep uh, the advent of uh, subsea systems, that means you are trying to reduce, if you can see, the, the footprint of this platform at the top is very less because most of the subsea compression, most of the subsea process or the, or the processing, oil and gas hydrocarbon processing is actually moved subsea. And these are very, very expensive, billions of dollars of investments. And this is something which the, the energy companies don't take very lightly. Uh, so subsea systems are, are very costly. They take a very long time to develop lots of testing and then deployment of them is, is, uh, is actually these are, uh, these are projects which are spent on decades and decades of development. 
similarly, what you can see over here is another another type of subsea structure. Um, one thing which you will see over here is a drill ship. So drill ship is usually very mo mobile. It's uh, uh, there are uh, uh, there are drill ships which for if for your if for your interest you can go down uh, later. You can ask look for something called Ice Max. Um, these are drill ships that actually can work not only in the normal waters but also in the frozen waters up in the north, in the North Sea, uh, Barents Sea, and uh, uh, these drill ships are very advanced and they can actually drill multilaterals as well. Um, these are dynamically stabilized. That means they will have propellers all around trying to stabilize the, uh, the ship. Then this is your typical land rig. Uh, we are going to discuss some of these, the components of the land rigs in the coming slides. And the shallow water bars, these have been around for many decades now. Um, these are primarily done. What shallow water barge is essentially a land rig made on a barge uh, so that it can actually drill in the shallow waters. And then your Jacob rig is commonly off in offshore developments, you will see a lot of Jacob rigs uh, because uh, they are actually rested on the on the sea, on the on the on the surface, uh, subsea surface. Uh, and they are quite mobile um, and they can drill all the way to 1,500 to 3,000 feet. And your drilling platforms, these are more advanced. Uh, you will have crew quarters at the, uh, on this side and your drilling um, and your uh, mud circulation systems and your drilling systems on this side and then there is a flare on this side. And then semi-submersible rigs, these are more for ultra deep water applications, just like drill ships. Um, they are dynamically stabilized as well. That means that they, they don't have a structure going all the way to the, to the subsurface, but they are uh, dynamically stabilized. They will have uh, uh, buoyancy tanks on at the bottom in which they can actually fill the water or release the water, and then they can actually stabilize themselves. And then, as I mentioned earlier, drill ships, these are very the most advanced in, in, uh, in the drilling fleets right now. They can actually drill on top of ice, frozen uh, frozen seas, um, very tolerant to harsh weathers, um, and super big crew, very expensive to maintain, uh, but very reliable. And this is a typical offshore coil tubing unit um, that is on the on the on the on the on the. Uh, uh, offshore platforms, and this is used either for you can use it for. Uh, milling, or you can actually use for uh, for cleaning, snubbing, um, any coil tubing operations. So this is just an example from, uh, this is not current by any means, but this gives you an example of what uh, British Petroleum is actually using right now. Um, and this is just a conceptual illustration. It can show you that they, they have semi-submersible, uh, semi-submersible, they have uh, what we call those uh, 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 tension leg platforms, and uh, and you can see that uh, how deep they can actually uh, drill. Uh, and their deepest platform is this thunder row, thunder horse that can drill uh, more than a little closer to twenty five thousand feet. What type of drilling hardware are we talking about? This is just to give you an idea, some of the basic systems of a drilling rig. Uh, you have what we call a derrick. This is the most iconic piece of a, of a drilling rig. This is something which you can, you can spot miles away. Um, so derrick is the most significant, significant piece of the drilling rig. It provides all structural strip stability as well as it takes the load of the pipe or casing whenever we are lowering it down the hole or pulling it up from the hole. Uh, then you have a turntable. I'm going to discuss uh, in the next slide uh, what the turntable is. Uh, and then we have big engines that are actually powering up the, your mud pumps and then your electrical generators and your drill bit, which makes up the bottom hole assembly. BHA, this is something which you will hear Whenever somebody is talking about a BHA, this that means a bottom hole assembly. It can be a drilling, uh, it can be a drill bit uh, made up with drill pipe, um, or it can be something which is going downhole for drilling purposes. And then your drill string is actually made up of drill pipe, 
and then your casing. We are going to discuss casing in incoming slides. Essentially, your turntable is uh, uh, is going to turn your drill bit, and it will impart uh, that rotational movement that is required to drill uh, uh, downhole. Hoisting systems, uh, this is the first system of a drilling uh, rig that I'm going to, to discuss. Uh, this is essentially used for raising or lowering your drilling assembly, your bottom hole assembly, for running your casing and your completion equipment. Then your rotating system, initially in the very initial days, still have it. Uh, we used to use what we call a, a, a rotary table. Uh, and what's going to happen is that it will have this uh, hexagonal or square pipe, which is connected to the topmost joint of the drill sting. And your rotary table, this is your rotary table, and your Kelly drive pushing, essentially this will rotate and it will impart that rotating motion so that you can drill down. Then uh, as the systems advance now, what we have, what we call a top drive system, in which this has been eliminated and you have a very powerful electric and hydraulic motor which is suspended from the traveling block. That means it's up uh, in the derrick. Uh, and that is an alternative to Kelly and rotary, uh, rotary table. And most modern rigs actually apply a top drive. And then your circulation system. This is, we are going to discuss circulation system in coming slides in more details. But essentially what it is doing is that it is injecting uh, mud or drilling mud uh, downhole. And then it is it, the drilling mud after it is injected downhole, it will come, as you can see over here, it will come up the hole and into the circulation system in which it is cleaned and recycled and injected back into the, um, uh, injected back into the hole. Uh, there are multiple reasons why we do it. Uh, first and foremost is to, so you have bit which is cutting the rock down here, down, uh, downhole. You want those cuttings to come up so your mud is actually bringing that up. It is also to lubricate and cool the pit. And another thing which it does is that it provides enough pressure downhole uh, to prevent this, this hole from uh, collapsing in. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the biggest uh, reasons why we use mud is to prevent the formation fluids from entering the well bore because if it does happen, this is what we call a kick. Uh, and then it, if it becomes an uncontrolled kick, it becomes a blowout. So we don't want that. That's, that's why we use heavy, heavy weight mud. Just a couple of examples of the circulation systems and solid control. Solid control is super important. We want to remove that cuttings that are coming from downhole. Uh, we want to clean it up. So what will happen is that uh, um, your your mud with the cuttings will come over here. Shale shaker will remove the cuttings. And then we have desilter and desander to remove sand and silt. And degasser is to remove any gas uh, that may have entrapped in that mud. And then mud tanks are actually to make sure that anything, uh, any gas that is left will be uh, uh, ejected over here. And then we have a suction line mud pump. Mud pump can be driven by uh, uh, engine. Uh, mostly they are driven by engines, but they can be also driven by electric motor. Uh, then they, you need an electric generator on site. And then you have discharge line, stand pipe, rotary hose through a civil, it is injected back into your drill pipe. This is just an enormous, enormous bit uh, to give you an example. And it is just, there are different types of bits. We are not going to go into a lot of detail, but some of them have industrial diamond faces to cut that really hard rock down, down home. And then drilling mud is essentially, it will be ejected from here and then it will come out of here. And uh, there are different type of additives that we can use in the drilling muds. Um, we to, to, to have different type of, uh, we can, the additives can be used to control the weight of the mud by cause by weight of the mud. You are actually um, mitigating the, the, the advent or the injection of the formation fluid into your drilling mud. Uh, then similarly, your drill string, drill string or bottom hole assembly is just a combination of your drill bit, your drill stem, uh, and then uh, you have uh, one of the concepts that you will hear quite a lot about is annulus. Annulus is just the space between your hole and your drill string. 
and that's where your oil, uh, not oil, your oil, your mud circulation is going to happen. From here, the mud will go up to the surface to be cleaned and degassed and desilted. Uh, well casing, uh, so what's going to essentially happen is that you will drill and then you will install a piece of pipe, which is called casing. And what you will do is that you will inject uh, cement between this annulus, which is the space between this casing. And this uh, cement will go behind the surface of the casing. And what will happen is that it will, it will prevent um, any formation fluid to come in contact with the casing. Um, and it, it will also kind of hold it in place. Although the cement is not taking the weight of the casing, it is just to anchor that casing uh, and seal that area around the casing. So you can see over here that the cement will be pumped from a pipe and then it, it, is, it is through this through the cement pipe and then it will, it will go behind. So as you start lowering more casings, you will have to lower your, uh, you have to lower your cement pipe, cement guard casing to move to the next uh, side. Um, I'm going to go, this concept can become fairly complicated as we try to go more deep into it, but essentially a uh, oil well, if you see a cross section of it, what you will see is that diff there are different type of casing, different type of pipes. Um, the first casing is called a conductor casing. The second casing is called surface casing. Uh, and then you have intermediate casing and production casing. We are going to discuss this, why there are different type of casing in coming slides. And then you have a casing with a liner as well. We are not going to go a lot of detail because uh, this is not so common as a casing and tubing schematic without a liner. Uh, your conductor casing is primarily, uh, so what will happen is that it, the drilling rig will drill a big hole. That is for conductor casing. Now it can actually run that conductor casing downhole either through a pipe hammer or either it can actually just lower that conductor casing and then just cement it. Uh, usually it is run from the depth of 40 to 300 feet. As you go deeper, this is what we call a, a, a surface casing. And it is done to provide that structural integrity to your well uh, to prevent a uh, uh, hole from caving in. Uh, this typically runs from 500 feet to 1,000 feet. Then intermediate casing is primarily your casing between your conductor casing and, uh, not, sorry, not your conductor casing, your surface casing and your production casing. And what's going to happen is that this is actually, it is much smaller casing. So you remember the conductor casing was big, surface casing was small, intermediate casing is smaller. And what it is doing is it can actually take more weight of mud. Because as you start going deeper and deeper, the the fluid column of the mud will become, become bigger and bigger, or uh, it will become higher. That means you have more pressure downhole. So intermediate casing needs to tolerate that uh, pressure. And then it also has to compensate for the formation pressure, because as you are going deeper, the formation is also exerting a lot of pressure. So it needs to be, so the smaller this casing is, the more tolerant it is to the pressure gradients. And then your casing liner, uh, this is uh, um, another cost effective way to run casing uh, string across the open hole uh, without running all the casing to the surface. Essentially it acts like you can actually anchor a, a casing. You can see uh, intermediate casing is actually not going all the way to the surface, but it, it is actually kind of anchored to the, your casing liner. And then your production casing. So when you reach to a target depth where your production zone or pay zone is, then your casing that is deployed over there is called production casing. And then your production tubing. This is the smaller, so it's a pipe under a pipe, uh, uh, within a pipe, within a pipe. So within the smallest amount, the smallest pipe, which is called production tubing, is just like as your straw. Uh, so this straw is what is used to bring the hydrocarbons up to the surface. Uh, one of the things which I mentioned earlier is your Derek. Uh, so Derek is part of your, uh, it's Derek and platform are part of your drill operations, whether it's onshore rig or offshore rig. rig. And um, it's something which is, uh, which is very iconic. Uh, 
the platform actually holds all the machines, uh, whether it's a top drive, whether it's a, 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 rot a rotating Kelly and uh, all your mud uh, circulation systems. Uh, what if what happens if you hit a pay zone and you can't control that? Because once you hit the pay zone, there is so much pressure that it is trying to come up. If you can't control it, you will have a uncontrolled exposure of hydrocarbons up at the surface. And this is what we call a blowout. A kick will happen. A kick is when you know that you have hit the pay zone. The pressure, there will be a pressure spike and you will be able to see it on your telemetry systems. But if you can't contain that kick, it will turn into a blowout. And that is what exactly what happened uh, in some of the disasters in recent history. Billing mud actually plays a very important role, as as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, and and this 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 is just a top section, top cross section of your uh, drill string with the pressure of mud. You can see over here that you have uh, a lot of pressure that that mud is trying to compensate, uh, and what it is also trying to to ensure is that it does not want to have, it does not want to fracture your formation. The reason for that is that if it fractures your formation, it will result in a hydraulic fracture and suddenly you have what we call a loss circulation. So you will have, suddenly you, you are not getting same amount of mud as you are injecting. And then you know that you, you have a failure down home. How do we prevent those blowouts? So uncontrolled exposure of hydrocarbons, how, do, how can we do it? Uh, this is actually done uh, by a device that was that was invented in early uh, 20th century by uh, Harry Cameron. Um, Cameron was the company that invented the blowout preventer. is is one of the first and foremost safety equipment out on the drilling rig. Um, and a lot of people, it, it it's it's something you can't get away with. Every drilling uh, platform will have a blowout preventer. And uh, there is a blowout preventer that you can see on the on your on your uh, left hand side, and then there is an annular blowout preventer as well. Uh, we are going to discuss a bit detail in the next slide. So BOP stack or blow blowout preventer. Uh, actually, there are two types of actually three types of uh, 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 subsystems. This BOP stack have annular preventer will prevent any annular space between your tubing uh, or your casing. So it has those what we call packer elements or uh, rubber elements that will seal that surface. Then you have shear rams and blind rams. So blind rams are primarily to, to uh, isolate um, or close the well uh, by closing the surface or the space between your casing uh, or, or space between your drill pipe. These are called blind rams, but they do not have capacity to cut anything. They cannot cut your drill string. For that, you need what we call shear rams. So shear rams are similar to brine rams, but these are actually these are like big giant cutters. Uh, once you close these shear rams, they will cut the drill pipe. Uh, and essentially what's gonna happen is that you want to isolate by, with your blind rams first. And once that, if that is not successful, you want to cut it and, and that will just shut down the well. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on the on the horizontal drilling. I think we have discussed it in a lot of uh, 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 in the previous slides. One thing which I want to mention over here is that earlier in the days, in the pioneer day, days, the bottom hole assembly used to make be made up of drill string and your drill pipe, and that's it. But as the technology has progressed, we now have much more electronics downhole. So now, as part of our bottom hole assembly. We have, uh, apart from your drill bit, what we have called uh, LWT two tools and MWD tools. So logging tools and measuring tools, or logging while drilling tool and measuring while drilling tool are primarily taking all the measurements that used to be done previously through wire line, uh, and they are doing it in, in a near live manner. So they are actually looking into formation pressure. They are actually looking into uh, where your pay zones are, where the sand is, where the cap rock is, and they are doing all that while you are drilling, drilling the well. Uh, 
Um, so this is just a real time evaluation. You will have, uh, you will drill your well, and then as you start going into deeper into the formation, what will start happening is that you will, you are also your LWD tools and your MWD tools are actually also. Uh, you can see the graphs over here. These could be acoustic measurements. These could be electric measurements. And through that, you can actually determine your uh, uh, pay zones or possible hydrocarbon zones. Uh, this is just an example, the things, how they have progressed right now that um, we can actually uh, drill the well and also visualize it in the 3D. Um, requirements of the drilling muds, I'm just quickly going to go through it. As I mentioned earlier, this is drilling mud has multiple functions. It is to remove the drilling drill cuttings, it to prevent hole from collapsing. It is to seal the rocks uh, to prevent loss of fluid. Uh, and it is also to prevent the flow of oil and gas while drilling because you don't want that. Uh, you want to drill first and then have your, and also uh, it is to do lubricate and cool the drill string. Um, there are two types of mud, water-based mud, WBM or oil-based mud, they have different weights. Um, the mud engineer is usually on location trying to make sure that your mud is of certain consistency. He's looking at the circulation of mud and he's also looking into uh, making uh, recommendations to achieve certain economical and technical uh, drilling aims. Um, shoulds and should nots of drilling fluids. It should remove, as you've been, as I mentioned earlier, it should do all the things that I uh, that I said it, it should do. It should remove cuttings. It should control formation uh, pressure, maintain well bore stability, lubricate, cool the drilling string, transmit hydraulic power to the pit. What it should not do is um, prevent the LWD tools and the MWD tools from working correctly. It should not have adverse effect on the formation. So you need to control your pressure of the mud because you don't want it to fracture your formation. Because if it damages the formation, it can have a long lasting effects. And also we don't want this uh, oil-based mud or water-based mud to cause any kind of corrosion of your casings or your tubing. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, through this, the density of the of the drilling fluid is is very important, as I mentioned earlier, because of the reasons. Uh, and whatever you do, try to make sure that you have your process under control. You are looking at your telemetry, you are looking at the pressures, and you are trying to predict a kick. Once you have provide, once you have predicted the kick, you have to control the influx of the hydrocarbons into your drilling fluids. That's pretty much the end. Thank you very much. That was Syed Hassan Ali. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This was uh, in the field of mechanical engineering and introduction to drilling. Actually, it's not quite an introduction, but as we had to deal with so many technical terms, but uh, pretty much like I said at the very beginning, we just got evidence that Dr. Syed Hassan Ali not only is fully knowledgeable in drilling, has linked to uh, uh, everything that's connected to uh, uh, the oil industry, but he possesses the experience, the skills, the flair necessary to teach us about uh, those uh, heavy duty concepts uh, with regard to uh, drilling well, gas or oil. A lot of technical terms. Uh, we don't have too much time actually uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, address all the issues that might come up on your end, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, we could uh, more or less accommodate uh, one or two questions. Uh, so please, uh, if you will, you may now ask uh, questions, which I uh, believe uh, Dr. Syed Hassan Ali will be pleased to address on your behalf. 
Now, as I don't see too many hands around, let me quickly come up with a question of my own, if you don't mind, Ali. Uh, how do people actually discover the existence of uh, oil or gas anyway in the world? So uh, in, in current days today, um, let's say if you want to discover oil and gas in a desert, what, what will happen is that they will do what we call a visual survey. So uh, aerial survey will be done and they will look into the geological features uh, of the area and they will try to find, okay, if there are uh, like certain type of rocks because presence of certain type of rocks, which are called cap rocks will actually indicate mm -hmm. that there can be potentially oil and gas subsurface. Mm -hmm. Once they find those kind of rocks in an aerial survey or the, or the land survey, uh, they will send what we call a seismic crew. So seismic crew will actually have very specialized equipment. Uh, they have trucks that can actually impart acoustic waves uh, into the ground. And they have uh, what we call ecophones or land phones, uh, which are very sophisticated sensors that can actually pick up those acoustic waves reflected from the subsurface uh, structure. And they can actually try to locate uh, hydrocarbons uh, down home. <laughs> That's a very, very long, complicated and complex uh, process. And I also assume that it is very, very costly. Uh, there are so many questions coming, popping up right now in my mind. But uh, the conference, the class, uh, actually is not for me. It's for you, ladies and gentlemen. So let's allow Columbus and Gelese to ask his uh, question. We are with you, Columbus. Your microphone is unmuted, Columbus. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. The sound is a little uh, more no, I, with, uh, Go ahead. I, I have seen what uh, the presenter has presented. Mm, but I was wondering good. what happens sometimes when people dream, they make up, they make the dream, the water comes, and people start uh, getting the water. But after a few mm. months, the water disappears. What happens? Is it that the water table has died? What happened? Did you hear that very well, uh, Hassan? Uh, no, Prof. Sorry, I I, I couldn't hear you hear yeah, very well. Sorry, it was very very muffled. Uh, very unfortunately, we couldn't hear you, uh, Columbus. If you would uh, please go ahead and write down the topic of your question on the uh, chat line. Eventually, if we have some more time, uh, Doctor Syed uh, will answer your question. Uh, let me ask something else as uh, we uh, eventually wait for uh, Columbus' question to pop in in our chat box. Uh, from what I've learned, uh, Dr. Syed, uh, there are many uh, countries that are not economically uh, privileged that have a lot of these wells, those wells of gas or oil and so forth and so on. Since from your initial response, uh, we can infer that the process of exploring uh, those potentials is extremely costly. So, uh, how do uh, poor people uh, proceed uh, if they don't have the money to uh, get into this uh, process of um, exploring gas or oil production. Indeed, Prof, uh, the, ex the process of exploring and drilling for oil and gas is very costly. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you, bef before you actually drill the well, there is a lot of things that you need to do uh, uh, that will actually cost money. Um, so it all, drives down to economic feasibility of extracting that oil. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in the in the developing countries or less developed countries uh, of the coast, coast of West Africa, uh, 
and now in Southeast Asia, there are some very sizable uh, offshore uh, uh, oil production. Mm -hmm. Angola, uh, we have oil production in Chad, we have oil production in Nigeria, and it all becomes very, very down to, to the numbers. So if the return of investment on uh, on uh, uh, on if the return of investment is actually feasible, uh, I'm talking about a couple of years to uh, it doesn't really matter where the oil and gas is actually located. We've actually gone in North Sea where the where the environment is really harsh. We have gone into off core offshore Guyana to uh, explore oil and gas. Uh, it all depends. Down, it it all boils down to how much oil and gas is present over there. Mm -hmm. For example, if I talk about my recent experience off the coast of uh, Guyana right now, there's a big exploration that is done by Exxon Mobil, and that is just because uh, these are the wells that are producing 99% oil at mm -hmm. the rate of 20,000 barrels per day. Mm -hmm. At 20,000 barrels per day, your econo it becomes very feasible to drill for it. So eventually it's it's a question of economics. Yeah, but uh, if the country cannot pay for the exploration, who handles that? Usually it's done by, uh, in a lot of countries that, that it is being done right now, it is done by the international oil companies, IOCs. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the, com the country will not have to pay for it. Uh, mm -hmm. The oil companies will pay for it. Uh, in fact, in a lot of cases, the oil companies will also develop the infrastructure. They will give money to the to the to the government so mm -hmm. that they can actually develop the infrastructure, because oil companies have a lot to gain from it, and they have budgets which are sometimes, in a lot of cases, bigger than the annual budgets of a lot a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. So That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your response. Uh, very unfortunately, I haven't seen uh, Columbus Ngeleses' question in the chat box. Uh, that is very, very unfortunate for a topic that is of interest. Uh, there is a question, actually, I don't know if uh, you want to afford the time for Dr. Said to respond. Uh, that's a question uh, from Jonathan Ame, who asks, what makes some boreholes to dry after some years? Sorry, can you repeat the question, uh, Prof? Okay, the way he wrote it, uh, Jonathan Ame, what makes some boreholes to dry after some years? Uh, the way I understand that, I remember you said in your presentation, Dr. Sayed, that uh, sometimes after 30 years, uh, you had to abandon the uh, initiative of exploring because there would be no more uh, production possible. So uh, I infer, I interpret that uh, this is the orientation of the question from uh, Jonathan asking, I repeat, what makes some bore holes to dry after some years? Yes. So uh, the decline curve, this is uh, a, the more technical term of this graph is like a decline, what we call a decline curve. Mm -hmm. And what it is telling you is this, this number is very, very arbitrary right now, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, just very mm -hmm. arbitrary. Mm -hmm. It can be within, within a year or so. Mm -hmm. And what it actually is telling you is that you do not have, and this is a, a much bigger uh, um, uh, question, that we do not have an unlimited supply of oil and gas, right? Mm. Uh, eventually, the reservoir will start depleting. Uh, you will inject water in it. You will inject gas in it. You will in inject different type of emulsions in it to get more oil out of it. But eventually, it will run out. And when it, when it runs out, it goes into a phase of the life cycle of the well, which is called plug and abandonment, p and &A. So eventually you will try to do the remedial, you will cut the casing, you will plug the well, uh, you will remove the well head. Uh, and then eventually it will come to a point where nobody would even recognize there was oil and gas well in, in here. Okay, if you allow me, if you allow us, uh, Dr. Syed, let's take that 
question that's going to be the last, ladies and gentlemen, as we've uh, run out of time. A question from uh, Kennedy, uh, Sayatontola. Uh, go ahead, Kennedy. Let's hear your voice with your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Kennedy Sayatontola from Zambia in Kitwe. Uh, this uh, topic is very interesting to me. So it has uh, prompted me to ask a question because we, uh, in uh, the presenter's uh, remarks, he has mentioned uh, some African countries which have got uh, oil and uh, drilling oil. Our neighbor, uh, this Angola, was mentioned. And uh, in the northwestern part of Zambia, there is a place where there is a, when the bush burns, uh, there is bush fire. You find that uh, there is a place where the sand, the sand which is around that area after the bush fire, there is a, 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 a fire which grows for some time, maybe for one week or so, when the whole bush has been burned. So we suspect that that area could have oil because the, the because of that fire which remains burning for some time. So now they we are neighbors to Angola. So my question is, could it be that uh, it's an indicator that that is a uh, soil which is burning after the bush fire for about three days to one week? Does it mean that that area could have uh, some uh, uh, some oil of some sort? That's my question. I submit. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting question. Very interesting. Um, it's it brings to it brings me to a topic which I didn't touch in this in this presentation. But however, I will I will try to address that. Uh, I'm not aware of this. Uh, like I'm not aware of this event. So uh, just a disclaimer that whatever I say, uh, please take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but when Earlier in the years, uh, I'm talking about early 20th century, when you started looking for oil, there was another type of formation that came up, which is called oil sands. So oil sands is, just imagine it's, it's sand laden with heavy oil. So if you will pick it up, it's mucky uh, and it's, uh, it's really thick, it's viscous. And, and essentially, and it's not very deep in the surface. It's actually, um, you don't have to excavate too much for it. Um, probably this could be a topic for, for another discussion, another, another lecture. But essentially, there are areas around the world, for example, uh, areas up north of Canada are full of oil sands. Uh, if you have the opportunity to just search it up, uh, these are big areas where the sand is actually laden with, with oil. And initially, very, very initially in early 20th century, even to the mid of 20th century, they could not find a way of extracting that oil from the sand. So, but later, uh, some of the pioneer companies like Saint Crude and Suncor actually developed very patented processes that can actually extract oil from sand. So yes, oil in a sand can occur. It is a very, uh, it's 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 not unheard of. So uh, the one which you are talking about in your neighboring country, it possibly can be. I can't say for sure, but it possibly can be. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Hassan. Uh, ladies, this is about uh, the end of our uh, class today. I wish. <laughs> Uh, I had the time to address that question from Tom Kisembo Mugisa, uh, who asked, is there a time in the future, number one, when the need to drill for new oil and gas will be completely disallowed? Number two, all existing oil and gas plants closed. Is there a time for something like that to happen, Dr. Hassan, as a closing? So, uh, and these could be my closing comments as well. Uh, uh, scholars have actually debated quite a lot about, will we see the end of oil in, in 
uh, or, or end of oil era in our in our in our lifetimes. I don't, I don't think so. I I don't I don't think it will happen in our lifetime. Uh, the oil uh, the oil that was easier to extract extract has become difficult. Uh, that oil is gone. We have we have used it in last 50, 60 years. Now we are going to areas where it was very it was used it used to be considered uneconomical to uh, extract oil. The oil is there. We have so many reserves that we can actually go hundreds and hundreds of years before mm. we actually will run out of oil. Hundreds of years, but extracting oil will start becoming difficult, more challenging, more harsher environments. Um, that's where uh, the question of economics will come, whether it actually makes sense to extract oil. But until until that economical question is there, unfortunately, the renewables are not mature enough to completely take place of oil. So I think we will keep on seeing these companies, these governments making decisions to extract more oil because it's 